Prosecutors and cops are sworn to protect and uphold the law and follow the rules. When they don't, when they lie, hide, and destroy evidence, and basically don't follow the rules, they destroy the lives and careers of courageous and decorated police detectives like former Florence, Arizona police detectives Hondo Hunter and Jerris Barn Robinson Von Zombie because they insisted on getting to the truth in three heinous crimes which were being covered up in the small city of Florence, Arizona. These whistleblowers and decorated cops endured retaliation and were eventually fired. Between 2007 and 2012, Hunter and Von Zombie reported their former police lieutenant Terry Tryon's cover-up of these felonies to assist his son and his associates. On October 1st, 2018, a federal judge ruled that the two former Florence police detectives claimed that they had suffered First Amendment retaliation and conspiracy from several present and former town officials and employees could proceed to trial. Here's Hondo Hunter and Jerris Von Robinson Von Zombie to tell you personally about their nightmare story of injustice that they have endured for the last seven years. My name is Walt Hondo Hunter. I'm a former detective for the Florence Police Department. I was wrongfully terminated in uh, December of 2012. I was reinstated and then terminated again in 2017. My name is Jaris A. Von Robinson Zombie. I am a former police detective at the town of Florence of Arizona. And I was wrongfully terminated because I turned in a lieutenant for tampering with evidence. When I decided to turn in my police supervisor, Lieutenant Terry Tryon, I knew the risk that I was running. It's been a hardship on me financially, mentally. It destroyed my career. How this has affected me emotionally, uh, personally, and financially was that it has affected my family life. It has affected my ability to continue my career as a full-time law enforcement officer. I mean, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think on this multiple times during the day. Well, the things I would like to see done here from this case is that I would like to see, first of all, my own vindication that, you know, what I did was right. One of the things I want is I don't want to have anyone be a victim of a crime and totally ignored by the people who are supposed to protect them. Also prevent other officers from going through this type of retaliation when they feel it's necessary to turn in a supervisor or a superior within their agency who is um, basically violating the law. We want justice for all across the board, no matter who you are. Seven years after the Florence Police Department fired these two decorated police detectives, and over five years after the filing of their lawsuit, the defendants have appealed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. The oral arguments were argued today. February 4, 2020. In their lawsuit, they challenged the racist and corrupt Florence Police Department of which they were once a part and how the department compromised public safety. In this insider exclusive network TV special, Injustice and Corruption in Florence, Arizona, Hondo Hunter and Jerris Von Robinson Von Zombie Story, our news team visits with Lynn Bernabe, founding partner, Bernabe and Cava, Pete Whalen and Erwin Chemerinsky, Dean of UC Berkeley Law and the appellate attorney, as well as Hondo Hunter and Jerris Barn Robinson Von Zombie, to discuss the unique aspects of this case, the legal challenges ahead, and the current struggle against racism and cronyism going on in Florence, Arizona, and across the country. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Phoenix, Arizona. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dean Irwin Chemerinsky and Lynn Barnabé to the show. Welcome to the show. Um, today we're here because you are arguing a case in the appellate court, the Ninth Circuit, on a case that you originally and still are the, the, the counsel for two 
um, Florence, Arizona policemen who were fired from their job. Tell our audience a little bit about your clients, who they are, and what this case is all about. Well, our clients are uh, long-term uh, law enforcement officers, one African-American, one Caucasian. And they work together in this uh, <clears throat> small police department outside Phoenix on very serious cases. And they worked well together. Um, and their lieutenant um, in the police department uh, 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 basically impeded their uh, investigations, gave back evidence, and stopped uh, a rape case and a home invasion case from being prosecuted. When these they reported the... Um, uh, the misconduct of their officer, um, uh, they were both fired. And they've been sort of uh, blackballed and never, and their careers destroyed. Yeah, just to get the timetable straight, they were fired in 2012, correct? Yes. They eventually filed a lawsuit in 2000, 2013. 2013. Here we are, 2020, and that's where Irwin comes in the picture. What's happening today? What happened today? The defendants asked the trial court to dismiss the lawsuit. And the trial court said no, that there's a dispute as to the facts. And in our system, when there's a dispute of the facts, it goes to the jury to resolve. But in certain circumstances, the denial of dismissal can be immediately appealed. And here, the defendants sought that immediate appeal to the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. And the case was heard this morning. And they were denying it because of what reason? They didn't deny it, but they were, their defense of denying was what reason? What the defendants argued is that the First Amendment didn't protect the speech of these two officers. The officers claimed that the reason they were fired was the letter they wrote to the town manager, the letter that they wrote to the director of human resources, the letter that they wrote to the chief of police. And therefore, their firing was a violation of the Constitution. But the defendants said no under some Supreme Court precedents, it couldn't be said that the Constitution protected the speech of these two officers. How did it go in court today? It was an unusual oral argument because usually appellate arguments are an exchange between the lawyer and the judges. And the judges are asking questions. My experience is often I don't get to say a few words before the questioning starts. This morning, there were no questions from the judges. And so I was a bit taken aback. Um, disconcerted by they simply let me talk and explain why this was speech protected by the First Amendment, because it involved important matters of police and government misconduct, and because these were individuals who left the chain of command to alert the town manager, to alert the head of human resources, to alert the police chief that felonies were being committed by officers in the department. Does a police officer have that right? If his chain of command is not enforcing the law, do they have the right to go outside that chain of command? I think clearly under both Supreme Court and Ninth Circuit precedent, the First Amendment protects officers when they depart from the chain of command, so long as their speech involves a matter of public concern. Of course, the argument this morning that I made to the court was, this is public concern because it's about government misconduct, it's about misconduct by police officials. Those three cases that they felt were not being properly investigated were what then? Well, uh, the first, the earliest case was the rape of a 15-year-old girl. Uh, it was called uh, the desert rape case or alleged rape of this 15-year-old girl. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the lieutenant who, uh, uh, well, in the course of the investigation, they took the cell phones of the student. Who had recorded the rape. Who are believed to have recorded it. And then the lieutenant ordered them uh, to be turned back, including uh, the cell phone of his son. To the owners of the cell phone? Yes, to the students. Who immediately er erased them? As far as we know, yeah. And so the case could never be prosecuted. The second case was um, <clears throat> uh, uh, a, a case of misconduct that they were attempting to reinvestigate, and they were fired for that. And that was the case of a... Um, uh, eight-year-old boy that was uh, killed in his home. The only two members in the home were his father and uh, a two-and-a-half-year-old brother who was developmentally disabled. Uh, <clears throat> the police officers who investigated pinned the uh, death on the um, two-and-a-half-year-old who couldn't have possibly either handled the gun, got it out of the lock cap or the, uh, the cabinet, or even lifted it. And they ignored all the evidence that should have um, alerted them to the father's culpability. And, and that included hand, uh, powder on the father's hand, 
other incidents of alleged uh, uh, abuse of his child and, um, 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 and, and his looking at for a um, life insurance policy. Right. And these cases are being ignored because they happen to be friends of the police. Well, at least the first one was in a home invasion case. It was the same thing. They weren't the uh, 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 evidence was turned back because it involved uh, the friend of, uh, uh, of the lieutenant. Uh, the third case, I think, was incompetence. And when uh, 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 Varn and Hondo tried to reinvestigate, they were fired for it. You know, Erwin, you often hear this, this term, justice delayed is justice denied. You, as a scholar and dean of one of the most prominent law schools in the United States, um, when I look at this case, it was filed 2013. Here we are seven years later. How do you address to anybody who's not familiar with the American judicial system that perhaps uh, justice delayed is a, is a way of our system? Justice delayed is justice denied. And yet the trial and appellate process take time. So in this case, you had the discovery, the depositions that were taken. You had a motion to dismiss. The judge had to rule on the motion to dismiss. Then the defendants used their right to take an appeal to the Ninth Circuit before a jury trial would happen. And that then requires time to write the briefs, to get scheduled for oral argument. And here we are in February 2020, and it's just been heard by the Ninth Circuit. That said, I'm hopeful that the Ninth Circuit will quickly in favor of our clients and it will go back for a jury trial before too long goes by. Meanwhile, your clients have not been able to get a job in law enforcement, have they? No, they, they, their, their careers are destroyed and they've spent the, the best part of their adult lives in law enforcement. Uh, Varn started out in the military, in the army, in the police, worked in law enforcement after that until he got to Florence. They, he flourished at Florence, as did uh, Hondo. Um, until they ran up against this lieutenant. Hondo, the same thing. He worked in law enforcement his whole life. And now, because of the retaliatory actions of the department, they can't, can't get law enforcement jobs. Any parting words on this case, Erwin? I think this is a classic case of police officers who were fired for exposing wrongdoing in the department. They pointed out that a lieutenant had committed felonies that the lieutenant had violated basic police procedure by involved in a case where his child was a suspect. And these two officers who did their job have suffered the consequences for it. And I'm hopeful that in the end, the courts will rule in their favor and they'll get compensation for their losses. We have with us um, your partner. Yes. Um, Pete Whalen. And uh, your expert that you've used in this case, Ron. Herbert, yeah. Uh, so we're going to bring them on right now. It is my great pleasure to introduce Ron Hergert and Pete Whalen to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Pete, you're a partner at Lens Law Firm, Burnaby. Correct. Um, you are involved in employment and um, civil rights cases and that sort of thing, right? That's correct. And specifically in this case, and you brought aboard Ron as an expert in police uh, investigations, how they should be run, et cetera. Why did you select him to do this for you? Well, uh, Ron has a, a demonstrated uh, years of experience in law enforcement, including in conducting internal investigations himself for various departments throughout Arizona. And he has uh, proven that expertise with us by going through and examining what happened in our case and pointing out uh, how one would expect an investigation to be conducted and how, how it was conducted in this case, which is essentially the exact opposite of how it should be conducted. So, Ron, let's talk about you. You're a former, you're a retired police officer. Yes, sir. You were a lieutenant, I think. Is that correct? I was a lieutenant with Phoenix for 25 of my 32 and a half years there and then another four years in another valley town, El Mirage. You are a private investigator now? Yes, I am. Okay, for the past? Eight years. And you specialize, if you will, on being an expert in police matters, correct? Among other things, I, I do expert work, but I also do investigations themselves. I work for a lot of defense attorneys. All right. There are three cases that were the center of attention with the two police officers that are being represented by uh, Pete's firm. Um, tell us what went wrong, and we'll go through these cases one by one. The desert rape case, 
What happened that the police department in Florence didn't follow proper procedures? Well, it was alleged by one of the two detectives who was fired that a lieutenant at, at Florence PD had uh, given evidence back that scuttled the case. They gave the cell phones, I understand, back to the people who had taken uh, video of the actual rape. Is that correct? One of whom was the son of a, a lieutenant on the police department. They felt that that lieutenant had improperly uh, involved himself in this investigation and should not have because of his son being involved. And that was Lieutenant Tryon. Yes. Is that right? Yes. So um, the second case was the killing of a nine-year-old boy, I believe. Um, apparently, he got a hold of a gun, right? In his home? Well, apparently, uh, the nine year old was shot, and the, it was alleged by the father that the, a younger son, who's much younger, had used the gun and shot the older boy. And uh, there were a lot of questions about that investigation. It, it may, in fact, have been the father that had shot. And uh, Lieutenant Tryon was the lieutenant in this case, too, correct? Yes. Okay. And why? Do you think that the that he stopped two of his key detectives uh, investigating it further? Well, I'm not sure he did in that case. These detectives were allegedly fired because they had reopened that case on their own. That's what was alleged by the, the chief who fired them. But the truth is they had been directed to reopen that case by the existing chief at the time. So the premise was not true that they had done something wrong by involving themselves in that case. Uh, and the third case is a home invasion case. What, what went wrong? Why was that investigation stopped? Well, the lieutenant had given the, there were weapons seized. Lieutenant Tryon. Lieutenant Tryon. Uh, Detective Warren Robinson wanted tested to see if they were involved in another case. And the lieutenant took it upon himself to release those weapons back to the gentleman they had been seized from, which made it no longer possible to test those weapons. Warren Robinson thought that was improper. The lieutenant should not have done that. And your report that you have, it's a very comprehensive report that you've given to the law firm to use in the case. Um, what are you, to summarize it, what are you saying should be done, wasn't done, and what do you want to see done? Well, I was commenting on the documentation that the chief produced to support his termination of the officers. I determined they had not conducted a proper investigation. The misconduct that they alleged the officers had committed was not in fact committed, and an investigation which had not been done, had it been done, would have shown that to be true. In essence, they were wrongfully terminated for bogus charges. Uh, in cases like these, you were a police officer. You said what, how many years? 36 and a half years. 36 and a half years. You've undoubtedly come across situations where your supervisor tells you to back off. Sure. What is a police officer supposed to do? Well, when an officer is given an order, according to the policy of the department, they're to follow it, unless they think it's illegal or immoral, in which case they should bring that to the attention of someone higher up uh, to question it not just to blindly do something they know to be wrong. In their chain of command, in the police department? Normally. What if nobody's listening in the police department? Well, most government entities have m mechanisms in place. In Phoenix, where I was employed, there's a man city manager's hotline, which says to any employee, if you think you can't trust your bosses and you think there's something wrong, you will be given an anonymity to, to bring that complaint here so it can be investigated, which it needs to be. So. Employees are encouraged to report the misconduct of their superiors to someone other than the superior if they feel that the superior is the person that can't be trusted. But there was no such framework in the town of Florence, within the Florence Police Department. That they could go outside the chain of command. Exactly. In fact, the two officers in our case were specifically instructed not to go outside the chain of command. They had to do so anyway. They did so out of their obligation more as private citizens than as law enforcement officers. They tried to go to the chief, and as you said, the chief essentially said, stand down. And they realized that they had to do something else. And that's why there are First Amendment impl implications in this case, because they went outside their chain of command and went to the Human Resources Department and to the town manager. And those two offices obviously generally have no involvement in the investigation of criminal, alleged criminal conduct. So the overriding issue that takes precedent is your freedom of speech, 
your First Amendment rights. Which includes for that First Amendment right for public employees. In your 36 years as a police officer, how many times did you see someone do something similar to this where they thought their, their supervisor wasn't doing the right job? Uh, wasn't investigating properly, went outside, and what happened to them? Well, I've investigated several cases where someone's written a letter to Arizona Post. Arizona Post is the certifying body. So an officer who thinks they can't trust their chief might write a letter to Arizona Post. Is that an anonymous letter? Well, the, it could be anonymous. Uh, it could also be with their name on it. But they're asking Post to look at it because by doing so, they're saying, I'm asking you to investigate the agency head. Now, Arizona Post can direct that back to the government entity itself, the city manager. Uh, sometimes these get referred to the Arizona Department of Public Safety to conduct investigations. And I think that happened in, in Florence eventually. An outside agency was asked to investigate their concern. Pete, there are other allegations that have been made in the city of Florence that relate to discrimination. Racism, correct? Absolutely, yes. What what can you share with our audience about that? Well, through the course of this lawsuit, through the depositions we've taken, we have learned that um, the mayor of the town of Florence, Tom Rankin, both before he was mayor and after he was elected, uh, regularly used uh, racial slurs to refer to Detective Arn Robinson. And he even admitted in his deposition that he used racial slurs and he essentially blamed it on his upbringing. Um, as a 70-year-old man, he's still blaming his parents for his racist conduct. And Lieutenant Tryon uh, was also, there is also testimony that's come out in the case that he also used racial slurs, specifically in reference to uh, Detective Vern Robinson. Lieutenant Tryon uh, denied doing so in his deposition. But again, that's, that's for a jury to eventually decide who's the more credible witness. Um, but there are absolutely allegations of uh, very blatant racially um, discriminatory terms. And Ron, did you find that the case to be in the city of Florence? I did not look at any racist allegations. I simply reviewed the, the police chief's report and evaluated whether that was a properly done investigation and concluded it was not. And keep in mind that Detective Ron Robinson himself didn't hear and, and personally experience his comments, they were made behind his back to other white officers. So his partner, Honda, uh, heard about these, these uh, racial slurs that were used against Varn Robinson, and that's how Varn Robinson learned about it. So it wasn't in his face, but that doesn't change the impact of this kind of racism in the police department. You were in the court today. What's your opinion of how things went? I think it went much better than we could have expected. I think the court um, did not push any of our arguments, did not exhibit any kind of skepticism of the legal arguments that we were making. They recognized that really there, there are factual issues that only the jury can resolve in this case. And the issue of whether the personal, whether the individual town employees such as Lieutenant Tryon and uh, Mayor Rankin and Chief Hughes can be personally liable, personally financially liable, um, they, are, they are exposed to that liability. And that could change even after trial. But as of right now, uh, they are uh, exposed to personal liability for the actions that they took. Well, great job. It's been a long time coming here, hasn't it? It certainly has. It's been what, seven years almost? He, the, yes. The, the, the detectives were terminated in December 2012, and the lawsuit was filed in 2014. And it's 2020, and it's still going. We have with us both of your clients, Hondo and Jerris. So let's bring them on right now. It is my great pleasure to introduce Varn and Hondo to the show. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. You guys have gone through hell and back, right? Yes. Correct. That would be correct. When I read this case originally, I said, here's a couple of guys that wanted to do right. You know, they know what the law is. They want to do the right kind of thing. They see someone who's their supervisor not doing the right thing, and they go outside. They tried their chain of command. Nobody was listening, right? So they report it. And what happened? Uh, we almost immediately started receiving retaliation 
What kind of retaliation? He was like being super critical about things that we were doing. Like micromanaging? And, and I mean, it's like you couldn't do anything right. Did at any time the lieutenant or anybody that was your supervisor come to you and say, back off this case and give you a reason? Uh, when it came to like, say, um, so we'll start with my case, which was the home invasion case. Um, he did actually do something similar to that, which was basically when I wasn't at work, it was my day off, he returned evidence that had been filed for um, DPS testing. And what did he say the reason why? He basically told Hondo, uh, when Hondo tried to stop him from doing that, uh, he, he told Hondo, well, Varn can't go around taking firearms from every white boy in town. The issue is he's returning evidence that has to be used in a in a case. Correct. I mean, that's illegal, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes. So who do you go to when that happens? Well, we, I was originally, well, I confronted him in the hallway and told him that these items are being secured for a later investigation. We're going to uh, take them to the uh, Department of Public Safety and have them analyzed to see if this was a weapon used in a home invasion. And that's when he told me, he says, uh, well, Varn can't be taking uh, weapons from every white boy in town. So I just went outside and I called Varn immediately and told him what was going on with it. And then I went to the chief of police or tried to go to, I don't even remember he was in that day. But needless to say, the weapons were returned to the suspect. And Lieutenant Tryon said, well, if you want to analyze something, go have him shoot off around. And actually, Lieutenant Tryon said that he would go to the guy himself who he's friends with and get the weapon back. But that never occurred. And because it's an AR-15 type weapon, the parts are interchangeable. So by the time we would have been able to get another search warrant to get the weapon back, well, the, the firing pin and everything would have been changed out, is what our belief was at that time. Obviously, it dawned on you that you'd be jeopardizing your career there, your job, correct? Did it? Well, it was more than that. Yes, we knew that any time we turned in Lieutenant Tryon, that there would be um, the chance of retaliation. But we can't have a system where we're having citizens that are totally victimized, and then they're being victimized twice by the police department, who's supposed to be serving the general public. Uh, Florence PD, did they have an internal affairs department? At that time, they didn't. Nobody investigating these. People. Right, and the town of Florence, uh, town manager, Humachi Patel, to my knowledge, had absolutely no investigative experience whatsoever. I had requested in my letter to him that they bring in an outside agency who had no fear of political repercussions, but I was totally ignored. How has this affected your careers and both of you you were with florence how long together how long about uh, i was with florence from 2003 so nine years started in 2004 okay so you've been law enforcement officers for how long uh the time i was terminated at like 23 years yeah i started law enforcement in september of 1996 but before that i was also military law enforcement so i was actually doing those concurrently so um did this jeopardize your pension oh yeah. yes Yes. You lost it. Yeah, there's no retirement. It's, it's pretty much been jeopardized. So let me ask you something. How has this changed your life? Oh, every, every way possible. I mean, personally, financially? Oh, sure. Personally, it was a huge hardship personally. Um, there's probably not several times a day that I don't think about it. Um, financially, it was devastating financially. Uh, Career-wise, our careers are over. They're done. Yeah. What do you want to see done in this case? the best you can hope for? Well, I would love to get my pension back on a personal level. I would love to see get my pension back. Um, of course, I'll let my attorneys deal with all the sure. legal aspects of it. And uh, another thing that is very important to me is I want to make it easier for the next cop who comes along and wants to report wrongdoing because we were actually used as examples of if you come forward, this could happen to you. Um, anything else you guys want to add? Well, I can I can tell you personally, as far as uh, experience goes, when um, they when an agency decides to uh, attack you, um, first of all, they 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 do the they try to discredit you. Um, they did that by entering our names on the integrity database, which is a big deal. That prevents you from getting a law enforcement job. It can. 
Oh, it's very detrimental to your career. Very detrimental. I've, I've applied for other agencies and I've gotten letters back saying, well, you know, your name is on this database and so we can't hire you, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's detrimental that way. I mean, it's, it's this, this situation has affected me and my family. Well, let's hope with this appeal that it uh, goes through successfully and you win your case. That's why we're here and we'll be following it up. And I want to thank both of you for being on the show. A pleasure to be here. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com.